talking to? Hi, everybody. My name's Ben Ager, and this talk is uh, Choose Your Own Adventure Through Crypto Land, or We Are the Choices We Make. I, my, I've, I'll take a moment back. Who am I? Uh, I've played with some crypto systems. I've actually worked on some algorithms. I worked on the successor of MD6, or MD5, MD6, which was MD6. I do RE. I've worked, uh, I'm currently an organizer for DEF CON CTF. What's up? Okay. No, no, please keep. I, I, uh, here, because of that, I'm gonna throw you the ball. You get to be my first victim. So during this talk, there will be a ball that will be flying around. So you may not want to stare at your laptops this entire time, and that person will choose where we go next. This talk is very breath-heavy, depth-light. I will try and make, explain intuitions. I'm not going to go any too deep into one topic. I'm going to hit as many topics as I can and essentially do a whole freshman crypto course in, or well, a whole crypto course in about an hour. If you have any questions for what I'm talking about, if you have the conch shell, you can ask me about anything on the slide, anything in the deck, anything anywhere, as long as you give me 30 seconds on Wikipedia to try and remember it. So we're going to be voting by beach ball because majority rule I've had major problems with because you can never distinguish between option A and B. This slide deck is long. It's about 250 to 260 slides. You're not going to see all of it. This was on purpose so that this way everyone goes a little bit different. But that also means this is going to be a little bit choppy. I don't actually know what transitions you're going to pick, which makes my life a little bit harder. We're going to do this DFS. So if we do BFS and essentially go top all the way down, top all the way down, we end up incurring a large overhead. Instead, it's just going to be top, go up a subject, top, go up to a subject, pop off the stack at the end. At the end of each section, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can tell me to start at the beginning, you can tell me to click one of the links, and or you can ask me any question. Good luck and thank you for playing with me. So you're walking into a forest and an old gray cryptographer comes to find you. In order to survive, you must choose what you would like to know about. To keep the secrets in cryptography or to burn the world down with cryptanalysis. Who's got the ball? You gotta choose, man. Burn the world. Burn the world. Okay, give the ball to someone else. Just chuck it. Don't even put the camera. Ah, even better. Here you go, sir. Now, the wizard scoffs at you and brings out DJ Jazzy Jeff, who asks a fun question of, would you like to know about algorithmic or algorithms or asymmetric protocols? Algorithms. algorithms. So you're going to go way deep. And now choose an attack you want to know about. Do you want to know about, like, diffusion and confu confusion and diffusion? One of the pure and basic points of if they break, everything breaks. Would you like to learn about differential case of cryptanalysis? XSL or slide? Whoever has the ball has to choose what they want to know about. Differential cryptanalysis. Differential cryptanalysis. So this is going to be fun because we talk nothing about anything and starting in the middle of a weird, weird topic. <laughs> so, <laughs> what different, so it's tickling time. Differential cryptanalytic attacks were called uh, were originally called tickle attacks because if you tickled the bytes in just the right way, you get something unexpected out. You see something you weren't supposed to, and essentially what it, the way to do it, think about it is. Ciphers are supposed to violently change on any small thing. Any bit should have a 50-50 chance of changing the output of any bit, essentially, at random. We ascent, we attend, instead, what we try and do is we link, try and link two invocations of the, of the cipher, f of x and f of x prime. What we do with that, once those two are linked, we can actually figure out something wrong. Here's a simple cipher. This is actually a three-round cipher that was used in a CTF. And what we can see is it consists of an add, an add, or sorry, a zor, a zor, and an add. Now, it's an SP cipher, and what you're actually seeing is this guy showed and actually tracked that it was a single bit that didn't actually map to all of the other bits. It only mapped to these one, two, three, four, five, five separate subbits. So you can actually isolate it and look at the differences. Now, what that means is when you're isolating it, it would start to leak out information. <coughs> Sorry. It would start to leak out information about the key because those bits didn't propagate all the way down. If you flip the one, it gave one bit about the key, flip the zero, it gave a different bit, a little bit of information. And he could, 
continually ask this question to keep on going and looking at the tiny, tiny differences because the propagation doesn't flow. The entire like intuition of that Small differences, if they don't cause large differences, there's a relationship. And this breaks one of the fundamental properties of cryptography called diffusion. Which makes confusion harder. Anyway, so we can make guesses on that and we can understand. So it's just looking at the differences. But there's another type of differential cryptanalysis. We originally we made a relationship between one bit and several bits, but you can also look at relationships that can never happen. These are called miss in the middle or impossible differential cryptanalysis. This was what was actually used to break a good chunk of Enigma. Enigma will not never actually, if you encrypt a letter in Enigma, it will never actually decrypt to that same letter. So this may greatly decrease the entire space of what you had to search to break an Enigma. And this magical little attack, this magical little thing, originally found in the early 1940s, essentially disappeared from all literature until it was rediscovered in 1990. For 50 years, a group of people knew about this and the rest of the world didn't. And just you have to keep in mind throughout all of this, everything's related. So I'm just going to keep on yelling about propagation, which won't make much sense unless you choose a different branch of this afterwards. But <laughs> you have to look at how the difference is And either and you're just looking for relationships where things don't change as much as they should. Finn. Okay, who has the ball? Sweet. Would you, what, okay. Uh, we'll go all the way back to, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of them. We'll go all the way back to the start because I forgot to hyperlink that slide. And, We'll go with you. You want to learn about secrets or burning the world down? You want to keep the secrets. Okay. So the old man strokes his beard, drunkenly attempting to do the, in a bad ET impersonation, asking, the light is what binds us. It's what makes us whole. Wondering what you would like to know about. Do you want us to learn about touching your own internal light or touching others' lights? Cool. So, uh, <laughs> so asymmetric cryptography is essentially when two people try and talk to each other without that person being able to either eavesdrop or change the. If I want to have a private conversation with this gentleman and I need to talk past this time, sir, we need to be able to have a conversation and him not know anything what we're speaking about, and that's essentially a little bit of asymmetric cryptography for encryption. Key exchange is how do we get to the point where we can get to that place, and signature is actually a little bit different because it's stating about integrity. Cryptographic signatures are literally just, I promise this guy said this. That's all they are. So now we must ask, which type of light would you like to know about? Would you like to share this world and hear of others? He asked, would you like to go old school or new school? I can't grab this ball. So you want to learn about Homer Simpson or the new pool? The new school, damn it. <laughs> uh, the new school. So I'm going to give a little bit of history on this talk for 30 seconds. This was originally given at SummerCon, so there will be references to drinking games and cursing. I've scrubbed most of them, but there are a few that are still there. So I'm going to use my, uh, yeah. <sighs> okay. So... There's two terms at the top of this, DDH and CDH. DDH is decision to become. What that says is given a G to the A and a G to the B and a G to the AB. Can I show that G to the A and G to the, G to the AB is equal to, sorry, G to the A, G to the B, G to the C. Can I show that G to the AB is equal to G to the C? Then the harder one is computational that the helmet which states that given a G to the A and a G to the B, can I find a G to the A and B? I have the odd feeling. Does anyone understand what I just said? Cool. Give me 30 seconds while I look for a slide. Uh, 
Cool. Here we go. We're going to just ignore your option and just go into an entire second session. I'll pop off the stack again at the end of this. But otherwise, yeah. So essentially, Diffie Hellman is three separate problems. Decision, which says, I have these three numbers. Can I tell if they are related in a specific way? Then computation. Can I, given two numbers, can I find the third number that matters? Essentially, given the g to the a and the g to the b, can I find g to the a, b? These are all in groups of size g with order q, doesn't matter. And then there's the discrete logarithm problem, which we think this becoming is, is at least a secure act, which states, given g to the a, find a. These are in order of hardness. G Decision Diffie-Hellman is easier than computational Diffie-Hellman. Computational Diffie-Hellman is, is no harder than the discrete logarithm problem, but we cannot say it is as hard as. Does that make more sense? Sort of? No? Okay. Uh, you got three numbers and you're trying to relate them. First question asks, are they related? The second one goes, find me how they're related. The third one goes, hard. <laughs> and we actually used to believe that CDH and EDH were equivalent. <laughs> Turns out they're not, and this is really important, and we'll go back to the next topic at that. So when many people actually say Diffie Hellman, what they're actually taught encryption, and not, it's not actually encryption, it's here. Those three little things, actually getting G to the AD gives us a shared secret. So the entire thing is given these two numbers, how can we both find a third knowing half of it where no one else in the world can find a third? Yet then once we have that, we can agree and start talking and start working together. That's what Diffie-Hellman is. So the actual how-do of it is, imagine you have two things of paint and mix them together You have either color, it's easy. In math curves, you start with two parameters, lowercase g and uppercase p. Lowercase g is important because uppercase g means something different. p is some large safe prime with some order that's big. Um, then g is a generator of p, which literally means you, if you multiply it by itself and then mod it p, it will go around a certain number of times. All it means. The actual agreement, Bob, Alice chooses A, Bob chooses B, Bob, Alice sends Bob G to A, Alice, she knows, or Alice sends Bob G to A, the other Bob sends Alice G to B. You essentially do module, mod mole, which is multiple, or sorry, pow mod, not mod mole, that was really wrong. Um, pow mod, so you raise G to the B to the power of A, and you get G to the AB, and you now both have a secret that no one else can figure out because computational Diffie-Hellman is still friggin' hard. And so we actually can agree on a secret while everyone's looking at it. Now, the reason why I took that is because we're going back to new school where we go more into computational and decision Diffie-Hellman. I know you're all really happy about that. Um, so in this world, decision Diffie-Hellman is easy, computational Diffie-Hellman is also, at any point, if I start confusing you, please feel free to speak up. This talk doesn't have an actual defined anything, so you can actually talk to me and I will respond. There are two groups, uppercase G, uppercase G1, uppercase G2. They can be the same. You, you choose something which ma you have a magical function called a wheel pairing that maps elements from G1 into G2. Essentially, that says you can go from here to here and some magical thing happens. So, map g to the a, g to the b is equivalent to g to the c, g because you can multiply them up outside of it. You can actually multiply the exponents you're raising g to and have them actually map to each other. So, yeah. Now, BLS, we have our magical mapping function, we have all those fun things, um, and we have some point that's our generator. 
we can actually make a signature scheme that's extremely small out of this. So someone chooses a random number less than Q, where Q is about 152 bits, and just publishes it, and that's my public key. So normally when, how public keys are like 4,096 bits, because we're working inside of an electrical bits has the same equivalent security as a 4,096 bit key, I think. It might be 400 bits, somewhere around there. I can never get the numbers right, we, you can Google it after me. So in order to sign, what we actually just do is take the hash of M, multiply X times M, and you'll get sigma, and then you just multiply it, say, send out sigma and M. This is because sigma is essentially XM, so XM and G is equal to the hash of G and the public key which we told everyone out about before. So literally, instead of a big ass signature, I get a 100 bit signature that I can send anywhere and it's really easy to compute, making my life super friggin' easy. That's why it's the new school cool, because it's so easy to do and it's starting to enter into all of our lives. Sorry man, I'm only 20 minutes in, you got another half an hour. Um, cool, who has the ball? Cool, keep the secrets for 200, Alex. Symmetric, yay. So, in entirely out of order fashion, symmetric cryptography essentially is giving some, random, giving some cipher that will take E of my message in a secret key, and give me M prime, which looks like random data, and then giving me a decryption function, and D of M prime and K gives me my original message back. Literally all it is, make magic happen here. So now, what do you want to know about? Do you want to know about like the ideal model of ciphers and how we think they should work? How ciphers actually work? Or what we think the world should actually do? So like, what would make a good cipher? How ciphers actually work. Fun. So the wizard strokes his beard knowingly and longingly, wondering quizzically why you would choose such a thing, and asks, would you like to know about how many of me, or which, would you like to learn, so how many of me is Feistel ciphers, and which of me is substitution permutation ciphers? These were crappy, like, puns that I decided to put in here, I'm sorry. How many of me? Feistel ciphers! <laughs> So, here you go, man. I'll just, I'll just come and the ball for you. So the wizard offers you a riddle. I, give, I can give you a magical box that can take a random oracle, the most magical boxes, and give you a random output. Yet I cannot go back. Give me, how will I do this? So essentially, I have a function that will go, and it's essentially something that looks like a hash function. I can take a key, get an output, but I can't go backwards. How do I make a cipher out of this? And we have the Feistel network. So the Feistel network is actually how a lot of early ciphers were like around. Uh, Lucifer, Yes, a lot of things can actually be broken down into Feistel networks because they're really easy to make in hardware. And essentially what they say is, I start, I take my message, I split it in half in the middle. I then have my magical key function. I store that with the left half, put it on the right, and I move the right half to the other, to the left. And I keep doing that some number of times. So essentially, I'm actually going and just take it, move it over, zor it, take it, move it over, zor it, and just keep going around. And if you do this three times, you will have a strong cipher. Four times, you can have a stronger cipher. And it's a very simple construction because it's really easy to program. So anyone can actually build this because it's really 12 lines of Python if you want. You shouldn't, but you can. And you can take these pseudo-random functions and actually do it. And here's a little bit of pseudocode for those so inclined. Because this is the entirety of it, like a Feistel network in Cypher, except for magic function, which you have to write yourself. But the hard really this friggin' thing where magic function is a 30 line, or well, a 300 line magical thing in the middle. And that's all Feistel networks are. Decryption is quite literally, you saw that one? We zor below it instead. Very, very sneaky. 
And now, why do you care? So, Des was a scheme. Lots of things are actually still based on Fistel networks. We've been moving away from them due to speed concerns lately, but by and large, a lot of modern crypto is still based on Fistel networks from so many years ago. Why do people do this? Well, first, encryption and decryption are almost the exact same operation, so it's really, really small. Second, it's really easy to build. Yes, sir. Now, why do you need three rounds? Cause with one, if I do a one round Feistel cipher with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in secret, I get five, six, seven, eight in my output. Probably not a good thing. So one round you can patently see is fucked. <laughs> why not two rounds, I ask you, my good friends? Well, two rounds is a little bit trickier. So. You have to keep in mind that each round, right, goes to left. And so after two rounds, those two still have a very strong correlation. Left and right go essentially go R prime, and R prime essentially, left will equal X to Zor. The left half Zord with itself, or with the right half will equal the, will equal the inverse of itself, which is really, really bad. And so, Y3. Well, that's where Ruby Lakoff comes in. Ruby Lakoff is a proof from the 1980s, which essentially said, you can do this with three rounds. Feel free to Google it. I'm not actually going to go into it, except to state that it actually gets even weaker, but if you do four and you can show that it's a pseudo-random permutation, you can actually do a lot of strong security guarantees with it, which is why people love this construction for so long. Um, yeah. Now the wizard goes and congratulates you for listening to him, Babylon. And he uh, gets in an argument where he splits into his other stuff and asks, shall we play a game or would you like to know? Yeah. I was going to ask about Dez. Um, so was the original Dez, is that three rounds or is it triple Dez? No, Dez is, I think, eight. Okay. Maybe 12. I can double check. In general, you take whatever you think you'll need and you double it because... You're never, it, it's never as good as idea. Um, you can Google it, I might be wrong on that. I know it's more than eight. Sorry. Uh, triple Des also is encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, which is all weird and funky and annoying. And not going into that one right now. Um, cool. So, who has the ball? Do you want to go to the beginning? Would you like to play a game, or would you like to learn about modes? Modes. Cool. A la mode. So you have to keep in mind, actual ciphers work on very small blocks. They work on usually 128 bits at a time. So that means no one actually sends a message that's 128 bits. So you got to figure out how to use it. And that's where it gets into fuckery. So, modes are actually very complex and an active area of research, and there are many modes. We're going to look at four of them. Electronic codebook, cipher blockchain, counter, and what's called AEAD, OCB. Uh, I'm going to go to the next slide because I actually say what they all are in the next four slides, so instead of just babbling on. So, what the frick? Sorry. So, if you, My grass is not if you break the streaming blocks of and you apply the Zori three times, right? Uh, let's say that you have two identical blocks, and you store uh, each one of those blocks three times. My question is, will the output be the same? Yeah, that's what we need to see in the next slide. Okay. 
Sorry, getting ahead of me. So essentially this is, take your ball, let's cipher it into 128-bit chunks, encrypt them each without any chaining together. And padding must be applied to the last block. So when you're encrypting them, you get 1, 2, 3, 4, if you encrypt, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, you get the same thing, and you can actually see that blocks are identical inside of it. Metadata is leaking. Things are horrible. I can rearrange blocks, and nothing bad happens. I can twiddle, and bad things happen, but yeah. And so the obligatory penguin picture. This is a pet penguin picture that is called, that essentially is, on the left is a actual JPEG image. On the right is what JPEG thinks the image looks like. Because after you do a little bit of fuckery, because all the blocks are seen, you can still see the damn penguin! Don't use ECB. I'm sorry, that was a little bit angrier than it should have been. Now, CBC. Well, so this is Cypher blockchain. This is, each block actually does something with the next one. So, you can start with an IV, you get a Cypher text, and you actually chain it into the next Cypher text at each time. Now, this is considerably better, because though you can't actually tell the two blocks are the same. This is a good thing. But why does it suck? It can't be parallelized, first of all. So, earlier I said everything's about speed. You can't parallelize this, which makes it worse. I can also modify any individual block and only correct the next block. So it's fairly malleable. I can corrupt any, single, any set of bits I want in a single block by absorbing the previous block with those bits. It will zor inside into the output, which is bad. Counter mode. So what counter mode does is it essentially turns a block cipher into a stream cipher. I had water. Ah, well. So what this means is I just get a stream of bytes I can just zor in. It does that by taking a counter and encrypting it and getting 128 bits of out. Adding one and encrypting it again. Magic. And literally you just count one by one by one and you get a cipher, to, you get a stream that you can actually zor into any block you choose, and anywhere you choose. Why this sucks? The cipher text is extremely malleable. I can actually flip any bit I want in any cipher text I want, and you will never know unless you put a map on it. This is bad. Sorry, I need to drink water. And the rest of the text will decrypt without issue, such as think of changing admin equals zero to admin equal one. Something I've done before. It's bad. So now we're going to go into AEAD. What AAB essentially is, is it says, think of the encrypted text, I'm going to add what's called a MAC to it. A MAC is essentially a message authentication code. It says, this, the decrypted text should look like this. So it's just saying, you cannot actually screw, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, you can't actually screw with my like, encrypted text, because the tag that comes out the end is problem uh, will be a, will be incorrect, so it's really easy to see. Now, if you ever end up building something with crypto, and I strongly suggest you never get down to this level, you should use an AEAD mode. Next, why do these suck? Well, the problem is they all have side effects, and there are several of them. But we're going to talk about GCM for a moment. GCM is the most popular AEAD mode. It is beautiful. It is great. It is the worst freaking thing in the world to implement and great in the most horribly fragile ways. So most things can actually live a little bit if you reuse an IV. GCM that destroys the entire security integrity of the protocol, which happened with OpenSSL recently. This is a problem. However, we're going to talk about OCB mode. So OCB mode essentially says encrypt the number in counters, zor it in twice. So zor in a message, encrypt, zor it in, and get the counter out. You get a set of ciphertexts, and then you essentially just zor them both in at the end and add them to the end, which means it's parallelizable, it's easy to use, it's really fast. Technically, it's friggin' awesome. The guy who writes the cryptography engineering blog, Matt Green, great blog if you get a little bit of read something, goes, if OCB was your kid, he'd play three sports and be on his way to Harvard. You'd brag about him to all your friends. Technically, it's amazing. It sucks because of patents. 
OCB is patented, so no one freaking uses it. Sorry. Thin. Somebody have a ball? Sweet. I'm always good with burning a little bit of the world. Algorithms are asymmetric protocols. Yo, do oh. help. <laughs> Which one? Algorithms. Oh, no, that, ah, oh, goddammit. Sorry, it's hard for me to click. What would you like to learn about and then throw it? What's up? XSL? Cool. Now throw the ball to someone else. That's even better. So when you actually look at a set, you realize that you represent in a series of steps. I do A in round call one, I do B, and all the rounds are pretty much identical. They just compile on and pack on any of each other. So Instead of doing it as I do step one, I do step two, I do step three, think about it as a series of twos. Everything is connected. So because everything is connected, we can actually relate these things together in a system of equations. It's just like the quadratic equation, except there are 8,000 of them and there's 1,600 variables. But we can essentially start to tickle the cycle in very particular ways, such that this system So we can actually show, hey, think about the Cypress quadratic occasions, and we can start like reducing individual parts of it. Um, that being said, in the general case, solving multivariate quadratic equations is NP hard, so fucking luck. And we, just because we can wrap out of and such doesn't necessarily help us in the short term. However, there have been some things like uh, by actually can be seen as an extension of this, of uh, thinking about these things in sets of equations and relating them together to slowly prune key space. Thin. Oh, yeah. What? The original, the original audience for this talk it was a special group of people. <laughs> Listen, if you get a chance, I strongly suggest SummerCon. Um, cool. Who's got the ball? Burn the world. Burn the world. Oh God. <laughs> Would you like to know about padding or timing? Okay. <laughs> So padding sucks. Like, by and large, we don't break ciphers due to math at the moment. We break ciphers due to padding. <clears throat> Beast, uh, crime, crap, what was the other one? Heartbleed, yes, yeah, not heartbleed, some, well, heartbleed sort of. All come down to it's a bitch to pad your message. So the first ever padding bug, and this is my favorite. So in raw RSA, you choose an easy exponent. Three works really well. It's two bits, it requires two iterations around the bit banging thing. We, ne we never go above the RSA uh, modulus. So if I have like my RSA key is this, this is my secret, which I think says this is a secret. M to the E is actually significantly less than N, so it never wraps around. So I can just freaking take the third root and the message. Padding sucks. Yeah. Sometimes. Uh, it depends on which group of padding you would do. Uh, let's see, I think I have OAP somewhere. Yeah. Give me five minutes. And so if I take the third root, I get M. If E is too small, I get screwed. So... Now let's say instead we pad and it's deterministic. That means I can actually distinguish between different states. So if I get a significantly small message, I can do like, let's say, 500 small messages, and I can see that you've already sent these to them. That means that it's in CCA. 
When we decrypt, if you screw with things, if padding's screwed up and it throws a message, that tells me something about your key. If we decrypt and padding, and padding doesn't screw up, that tells me something about your key. We can keep guessing the last letter due to how certain padding schemes work and eventually get it out in symmetric ciphers because, oh my god, we know what the pad is and you gave me an oracle. This is essentially the core to beast. I just keep guessing the last letter over and over again until I get it right. Because if you, don't, you give me a different error between pad and fail and we decrypted right, it's just fucking nonsense. So, one of the good padding schemes though is OAEP. OAEP essentially is a padding scheme for RSA <laughs> that is randomized so that this time, I, every time I encrypt it, I actually get a different amount of data. It looks something like this. I have a message, a bunch of freaking zeros, and a random number. Take the message, I put the random number through it, I zor it with the message. I take that output, I zor it with that random ass number. And now I have two messages that I can cat into one. So what this does is the random number, every bit of the random number, fucks with every bit, sorry, messes with every bit of M, every bit of that me message that came out with directly influences that random number. So if any of those bits change, it messes up the entire message, and the padding is done and gone. There's also RSA PSS and several hundred other things. If you want to, you can look on Wikipedia and get a lot about this. This is a sore spot for many cryptographers. Finn. So this is how I feel about padding. Okay, so let's go back. Uh, who's got the ball? Uh, okay. No, it's fine. I couldn't care less. Would you like to keep the secrets or burn the world? Burn the world. You're going to run out of topics soon in this one. So DJ Jazzy Jeff is still wondering what you want. I should have. Cool. I've got five minutes. So do you want me to go down this thing, or is there any questions you'd like me to answer about crypto in general? What's up? Cool. What do you want to do? So you're, we're in burn the world. Algorithms are asymmetric. You don't care. You know what? Then I'm going to talk about timing attacks. <laughs> what? He absconded. I'm allowed to. So timing attacks actually really suck. What's up? There's another like 150 slides we haven't touched. I'm not joking. <laughs> uh, so timing is borderline impossible to get right at everywhere. So multiplication's a pain in the ass. And if you don't do constant time multiplication, it really screws your things up. Like it gives me your RSA public key. Oh, how do we screw with timing? Well, let's just push the RSA key into the magical frickin' thing of random data. It'll fix something. No, it won't. No, it won't. So, but because everything needs to run in the same time, it means everything has to run in the slowest time possible. So there's this fun game, how do I optimize the worst case? If you ever don't do worst case, you're giving me things to see about. Because the intuition of RSA timing is I get a number and a key. I actually have to raise that to a power. I can actually figure out how long each of those individual multiplication takes and whether or not you've done any one of them. That gives me information about your secret key, which I can then delete. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, Google Brumley and timing attacks or uh, brown and timing attacks. And essentially what this is, is the, if I can, if there's ever any data, there's, if there's any, ever any amount of time that's depending on data, I can destroy it and tell me things I shouldn't friggin' know. So I've got two minutes left, so I'm gonna stop talking. Thank you all, you've been a great audience. Um, hopefully I didn't bore you to tears. Talk to these people or do you have it? What's up?